El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras are some of our closest neighbors. Yet, many North Americans don't know that this region is experiencing some of the highest levels of violence in the world. Families caught in the middle of this violence have few options for protection or assistance. As a result, many people are left with no choice but to migrate across international borders. Crystal Sal is a human rights organization based in El Salvador working to strengthen assistance and protection options for victims of violence in the region through right-based programming, research, and learning. One case at a time, we come alongside victims of violence to provide protection when they need it most and repair the lingering effects of violations they suffer. One community at a time, we work to build human rights environments and create conditions where peace building is possible. We started by taking just one case. That case, and each new case we commit to, has a ripple effect. When we say human rights matter, we mean for all people in all places. We're fundamentally concerned about our brothers and sisters independently of what country they live in, because we know ultimately that how they're treated will affect peace and security for all of us. La discriminación de las víctimas es una realidad en El Salvador. Actualmente brindamos apoyo a la organización Tutela Legal y víctimas sobrevivientes de la masacre del Mozote, que han esperado justicia por más de 35 años. Un caso a la vez, buscamos que el sistema de justicia sea efectivo y garantice los derechos de las víctimas del pasado y del presente. Realizamos alianzas con comunidades para construir entornos de derechos humanos y reintegramos a las víctimas de violencia a lugares donde puedan resarcir sus derechos. Una comunidad a la vez, estamos construyendo entornos donde todas las personas puedan acceder a derechos humanos. Our Center for Research and Learning grounds its work in community perspectives. We work with vulnerable groups to research the discrimination, violence, and human rights violations that affect them. One group at a time, we're empowering people with the knowledge to defend human rights. With each case, we protect the individual lives of people at risk. We reject historic cultures of impunity. We build human rights environments and we send a message to the world about the value of individual human life and dignity. One group at a time. Una comunidad a la vez. One case at a time. We're advancing human rights in Central America. Thank you again, John, for uh, the invitation to be here with you all. Uh, and thanks for making time in your busy schedules. We know how important your work is as well. Um, it, it's an honor to be able to share what we do and, and to know that there are people interested uh, here in Palo Alto and Google. Um, so thank you again for, for sharing with me. I, I thought I'd start a little bit talking about the region itself. Uh, Central America is a place that's geographically close to us, as Kathy mentioned, who doesn't know a Central American. They're our neighbors. They live among us. They are some of us. <laughs> uh, but also our countries and regions have been interconnected politically, uh, interconnected in business relationships. Uh, but there, it's a region of the world that I think a lot of North Americans don't think a lot about, um, unless there's a negative headline in the newspaper. And one of the reasons or one of the ways that uh, North Americans have become more familiar or aware of Central America is through migrants, and more specifically through children. Uh, Central American children who uh, in 2014 surprised uh, our government, our country, because they came in the tens of thousands uh, unaccompanied to our southern border. Uh, and then more recently, uh, the situation of children being separated, migrant children from Central America being separated from their families, uh, I think shook the country again and, and made us confront difficult moral and ethical questions about uh, the way we treat people, uh, our, our neighbors, who come mostly looking for protection in our country. And I think that's what I wanted to talk more about. Um, the issue of immigration is, is obviously a polemic issue. But I think there's an important uh, statistic that we should remember when we're trying to interpret what it means in our country right now. Uh, immigration is in the top 10, if not five, uh, political issues of the day. Uh, yet, uh, strikingly, the numbers of immigrants coming into our country is at a 30-year low. Uh, so it's, uh, it's important to reflect on what is the nature of a m migration crisis if it, if it is that we have one here. 
Uh, and I think it's also important to put it in context to what's happening globally. Uh, there are more people in the world uh, displaced by violence than even during World War II, which was the previous uh, record. So there's a significant crisis globally in people fleeing their homes, a protection of crisis, because oftentimes they flee their homes, they aren't finding uh, the solutions that they're looking for. Uh, but in our country, we can't say that we have that problem of numbers. We can't say that, that our communities are being inundated by a, a, a wave of, uh, of migration, because statistically that's not happening. What, if we do have a crisis in our country, I would say it's a, pri it's a crisis of response. Uh, the, what's changed about immigration uh, from Central America and Mexico to the United States is the demographic. What we have now is less the profile of an individual coming from Central America or Mexico looking for a job or temporary work, and now we're having to deal with uh, the arrival of entire families, mostly from Central America, coming to the United States, and many of them are fleeing directly threats of violence and persecution, or indirectly uh, struggling to live in an environment of what we call generalized violence. Uh, and so that demographic shift in immigration has been a significant challenge because it raises, uh, uh, it ra raises important questions about our responsibilities or our government's responsibilities to these people who arrive. Have they arrived illegally? Are they criminals? Uh, how should we respond? And I think that's the, one of the things that made the, the, the policy of separating children from their family uh, so shocking to many people. Uh, because I think that there's a, a raised uh, or increasing awareness among people in the United States that children aren't here to steal our jobs or to cause problems in our communities. Something is going on in the region, uh, in Central America, that's moving entire families to uproot themselves at great risk to themselves uh, to cross a border with little expectation uh, that they would be received and given legal status something must be compelling them to flee. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit more about those conditions. Uh, this idea, the prospect of a demographic shift of migrants, uh, means that we have to challenge our traditional narrative about immigration in the Mesoamerican migratory corridor. So that means and we've thought for decades now that the primary profile of a migrant moving through Mexico into the United States uh, is an economic migrant one looking for opportunity. And that's, what, that's the nature of what a migrant is. It's someone who's chosen to leave their homes in search of a better opportunity or, or other, other options, education, family unification. But when people are compelled to flee, they act differently. Oftentimes, people who are forced to flee don't even have a destination necessarily. They're not moving with a specific plan that they thought out. They're moving because they were forced from their homes and are desperately trying to find an option. Uh, and that's different than when people are trying to look for a better opportunity uh, and having planned or chosen to, to take on the, uh, the, their immigration. And so in Central America, our work has focused on primarily on people who are internally displaced by violence, meaning that one of the patterns we see that's related to migratory outflows or transnational uh, uh, movements of people is that people who are fleeing oftentimes use internal displacement as a precursor to a transnational uh, migratory route. For example, uh, the first step may often be moving from one home to another or staying with a family member in the country of origin as a first means of trying to find protection. And when those people uh, exhaust the options for protection even or using family resources or even at times trying to get the state to assist them, then they make the decision to cross a border. And that moment's really important because when people are still within their national boundaries of the country of origin, uh, the international frameworks tell us that internally displaced people are the primary responsibilities of the state and the government of the country of origin. But when they cross an international border, when a person, this is the language of the Refugee Convention, is unable or unwilling to avail themselves of the protection in the country of origin, that responsibility to protect is transferred onto the host country. And the idea is that no human being can be denied a place on planet Earth where they can live free from uh, persecution and violence. 
is to say that everyone should be find, able to find some place on planet Earth where their rights uh, and basic protection can be guaranteed. And so when Central Americans make that, cr that decision to cross an international border, they aren't being often recognized as refugees. Uh, they're being treated as illegal or irregular migrants. Uh, and that's a problematic scenario because you have tens of thousands of people moving across borders, uh, seeking protection, uh, and no state is able to give it to them. It's almost like a, forcing a group of people to live in the shadows. To, I call it one of the greatest acts of privatization in our generation is the privatization of the responsibility to protect, which is primarily among states, but has been privatized to the families. And families do uh, courageous and often crazy things to try and find ways to get their members to safety. And when North Americans ask, for example, how is it possible that Central American parents send their children on a company to our border? It's because they're making those very difficult calculations about how they can find safety for at least one of their members. Uh, and knowing that the United States has made great efforts to deter migration by using detention or cruel conditions while in detention to send messages back to Central American families about their, how they'll be received when they come to the United States. That doesn't deter a family who's faced with death, torture, rape, or persecution in their homes. Uh, and so in some ways, these strategies uh, that are abusive to migrants in our own countries are also failures on a policy level because they fail to understand what it means to flee and not just to migrate for opportunities. Crystal Sal, uh, our work as a human rights organization focuses, as you heard in the video, on accompanying victims of violence. Uh, we're not necessarily working on migration. We see migration and displacement as a consequence of failure to protect rights uh, and, and a, a situation of generalized violence in the region. And just to give you a sense of what I mean by that, um, between 2005 and 2009, El Salvador, El Salvador, for example, per capita had a higher uh, rate of violent death than Iraq during the peak of their armed conflict. Uh, there was an interesting academic article written by a colleague uh, who wrote uh, the title of his piece was More Deadly Than Armed Conflict. And he looked at homicide rates in the Northern Triangle, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, uh, and compared those to combined homicide and casualty rates in countries like Syria or Iraq. Uh, that have open armed conflicts, more traditional armed conflicts. Uh, and the outcome of that analysis is that these are some of the most violent countries in the world, even taking into account countries uh, in open war. And so what you have in El Salvador is a situation uh, that isn't necessarily a traditional war, uh, but one that's generating humanitarian consequences that are comparative to other armed conflicts in the world. Uh, and that's something that has been difficult not only to integrate into this narrative about immigration, that perhaps we have a refugee crisis on the American continent, uh, but it's been difficult to integrate into the security approaches in the countries of the Northern Triangle. Uh, and what the governments have done in re response to violence is to declare war on criminal groups that are the primary perpetrators of atrocities and acts of violence, so street gangs. Uh, street gangs is almost a way, a diminutive way of talking about them because they have capacities that generally go beyond what we understand in the United States as a street gang. Uh, they control territories. Uh, they control many aspects of the lives of the people who live in those territories, like where they can work, how they can sell if they have a store, uh, where they can go to school, where you can get health care. Uh, we've seen cases where, uh, where young where grandchildren have gone to visit their grandmothers and had to cross an invisible boundary between one gang territory and the other, and that has uh, led to violent acts perpetrated against them in reprisals for having entered into opposite gang territory, even though those people aren't members of the gang. It's an example of how it's almost uh, as if, the easiest way to understand it is to compare it to the way dictators work. Uh, dictators control countries, uh, they control many aspects of the lives of the people, and people try and find ways to live within those countries, acquiescing often to criminal th actions of the state, uh, up until they can't, the point where they can't anymore. Let's say in, in Syria, well, I no longer can do this, maybe I'm going to protest. Uh, 
And as soon as you challenge the authority of the dictatorship, the dictatorship responds with persecution and violence against you. The same way that the gangs act in communities. Uh, gangs will force community, mem community members to pay extortion. They'll force uh, young members of families to join their ranks. Uh, they'll force women to become sex slaves or force, uh, we call them noviazgos, force the girlfriends of gang members. Uh, and so uh, homicide, disappearances, uh, sexual violence all become ways of exercising control in these areas. And the state is incapable of stopping that incapable of uh, holding back criminal groups who are capable of violating fundamental, fundamental rights of citizens. And what they've done, the states, is declare war on them. And in this war, uh, the state has militarized certain parts of the country uh, and used primarily repressive and military means to try and reduce violence. Abandoning the consequences of that violence, meaning that the entire security approach has been to tr uh, uh, a militaristic one, and there are no programs to assist victims of violence. Uh, so when families are, do become victims, the justice system, the police, the social security networks, the women's protection institutes, the children protection institutes are unable to do anything for them. And so when we try and understand why Central Americans or Northern Tri people from the Northern Triangle leave the region, primarily it's because of commissions of violence by criminal groups, gangs, death squads, narco-trafficking groups, but also violence uh, by the state, the army, the police, uh, in the context of a war on gangs, and then omissions, the failure of the state to do anything to guarantee their lives, to assist victims. And so our goal as an organization is to provide victims uh, with a safe space and services to stabilize their lives uh, and in that sense, it's a very humanitarian mission to try and save lives, but also use that assistance to help people to see themselves as agents of change, to try and change and challenge the security strategy, to try and build and strengthen the national protection system so that other families uh, who are in similar situations won't suffer uh, without any recourse. Uh, and so I, I left on your rows uh, a poster. Uh, a little poster that we made um, of a drawing and a poem. And I wanted to share this as a story with you to kind of highlight how our programs work. Uh, this drawing was made by a young girl in one of our safe houses. Uh, and this girl uh, was a member of a family of 30 people. And this family lived in an area controlled by a gang uh, on the outskirts of the capital of El Salvador, San Salvador. Uh, and this gang uh, came one day to the family and, and raped two of the members. And the gang raped two members of this family and told the family uh, that if they reported the crimes, uh, if they resisted the gang's future uh, demands, that they would all be killed. Uh, and so when the family was threatened and, and suffered these acts of violence, they displaced to another community in El Salvador. Uh, and while they were in hiding in, in a house in another place, uh, the military entered into the community in an operation uh, with the police in which they began to detain many of the young, young men in that community. But they entered into the home where this family was in hiding and began to fire. And they killed the matriarch of the family. And they told the family members that if they reported this crime, if they said anything, that they would all die. And that's when they entered into our program, where we were able to provide safe house protection for them, uh, humanitarian assistance, legal assistance, psychosocial assistance, medical assistance, to try and stabilize the family. But in that process, we began to talk to them about their rights, helping them see that the violence uh, and displacement that they had suffered isn't their fault, that it's part of a system a security strategy that's imminently violent, but also part of a structural problem in which the state or the society hasn't made a commitment to protecting and assisting victims, but that there's something that could be done about that. And we began to talk to them about maybe reconsidering uh, reporting what happened. And we mentioned to them the option of doing what we call strategic litigation. That in El Salvador, there is a special mechanism that in the 
case of violation of constitutional rights, citizens can go directly to the highest judicial authority, the Supreme Court. Uh, and we asked them if they would be willing to make a claim to the Supreme Court holding the Attorney General, the Minister of Defense, the Minister of Justice and Security, and the Salvadoran Legislature responsible for violating their constitutional rights and failing to protect them. And they didn't really even think about it very long at all. They said, we understand what happened to us, and if we can do anything so that other families don't suffer what we have, then it's worth the risk of trying to seek justice. And so we went, we, uh, they gave our, our lawyers, our legal team, uh, legal powers, and we presented a claim to the Salvadoran Supreme Court uh, suing those people I mentioned for violating constitutional rights. Uh, I know this sounds a little bit boring, but to make the long story short, on July 13th, the Supreme Court of El Salvador ruled in favor of the victims. They said that the Salvadoran state has to recognize internal displacement by violence and their responsibility to protect victims. They gave the state 60, or six months to create a legislative framework to build policy proposals and make a budget priority for programs uh, in the national budget uh, to assist victims. And so we moved quickly with the family. Uh, they gave us, uh, they authorized us to draft a law and present it to the Salvadoran legislature uh, about two weeks ago, a special law to uh, build a res national response to assist internally displaced people. Uh, and the law, uh, when we presented it to the security uh, committee of the, of the legislator. The president took it directly to the legislative assembly and asked for a streamlined legislative process. And we needed 41 votes for it to be admitted. And we got 44 on the first, uh, on the first round. And so now the, the law is being assessed at the uh, legal offices, all the ministries, and it's moving forward. So we have this unbelievable opportunity. We're working with one case, with, as we said in the video, with one family uh, to safeguard their lives we're now in a position uh, to design the first uh, national response to internal displacement by violence in Central America. And that's in El Salvador, but we think that that model uh, can be used to also respond in Guatemala and Honduras. Uh, so it's, it's a great privilege of ours in the organization uh, to be able to work directly with victims and safeguarding their lives, but also be a part of expanding protection for human rights to an entire population of people and designing also uh, the national response to this great problem affecting uh, our region. Um, so that's uh, a success story. We're very happy. The, the, the poem I wanted to kind of draw your attention to, we translated at the bottom of the poster. Uh, the, the drawing, you know, we debated whether this was uh, something that's inspirational or not, but in the end, I think it's quite inspirational. You can see uh, in the drawing that there's a caged bird in the, in the mouth of the girl, uh, something that reminds us of the slogan that many people see on the walls in the communities that is, see, uh, hear, and shut up. That's how you stay safe. Uh, and this is, you can imagine, uh, a girl writing uh, in a clandestine safe house. She writes this poem and it says, uh, it's called Sadness. It says, if I am free, I will be happy. I am the light that illuminates in all places. I am your refuge and I'm your happiness. Uh, and I think uh, the poem in itself has its own merits, but when I think of how the courage of her and her family uh, in seeking justice and the impact that that's having on, or potentially could have on so many other people and families, uh, I think that she's right that she is the light and the refuge for many uh, in her hope. And, I, and if you like, you can take these posters with you to share the story with other people. Um, I wanted to just maybe close by uh, sharing a little bit of a reflection that we've been making about our work. Uh, Kathy mentioned that part of our commitment to working with victims in Central America has led us also to representing the victims of the El Masote massacre. Uh, El Masote is uh, the largest massacre perpetrated on the Western uh, in the Western Hemisphere in modern times. Uh, in 1980, the Salvadoran military entered into the village of El Masote and slaughtered over a thousand people, most of them were children. Uh, today, uh, Crystal Sal, as a private plaintiff, is, is prosecuting the Minister of Defense and the Salvadoran military high command, uh, the people who were the architects of the war strategy uh, 
uh, from 1980 to 1984. Uh, and that war strategy was one in which the military decided to exterminate all of people who lived in areas where there was a presence of insurgent groups. Uh, and one of the things that we talk about when we talk about these types of cases in which we're trying war criminals or trying people for crimes against humanity uh, is that we don't believe that in successfully prosecuting this case, uh, we will stop war crimes from ever happening ever again. But what we do think makes the struggle worthwhile beyond the victim's right to truth and justice uh, is that we have the opportunity to challenge the assumption of impunity. That is the idea that people, powerful people, can do what they like with weaker people simply because they can and there will be no consequences for it. That's one of the dynamics of dictatorship and authoritarianism is that this idea that I can do what I like simply because I'm powerful and I can do whatever I like with whomever I like. Uh, and when we, talk, when we look at those patterns, uh, sometimes they manifest, that impunity manifests itself in atrocities like the Almasote massacre. And sometimes it manifests itself in simple corruption. The idea that because I'm powerful, I can do what I like with the resources of the state, for example. And so this legacy in Central America of violence, uh, of abandonment of the victims, and of corruption is linked to a historic legacy of impunity. And so when we are prosecuting the war crimes, uh, committed during the Salvadoran Civil War 30 years ago, we think there's a direct connection with our work with victims today. And we also think that there's something important to be said in the world about this, the assumption of impunity. When we look around at our region and we look around at the world, we see a resurgence in authoritarianism. New governments emerging or governments transforming into increasingly authoritarian regimes. Uh, and we think that sending a signal through the pro successful prosecution of one of the largest unprosecuted war crimes will help us to challenge that assumption of impunity. To say that we can be the light, uh, like, the, like the young girl wrote, uh, in the world right now where we see setbacks in many protections of human rights. Uh, we see setbacks in the expansion of liberal democracy around the world uh, that we have to and we have a responsibility to continue to challenge uh, impunity, uh, uphold standards that we believe are the basis for or the foundation of peace and security in the world. And those standards, we believe those to be that all people are fundamentally equal in rights and dignity. And respect for that principle is the basis of peace and security across the world. Um, I'm not making that up. It's what the World War II generation signed into the Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights, the generation that suffered some of the worst atrocities known in human history concluded that our peace, that peace in the world is linked to my concern with how people are treated in my own country, but also how people are treated in other countries. Uh, and so I'll, I think I'll conclude my, my uh, remarks there and maybe open it up to questions. Um, so that was a lot of information. Um, what can we do here as people that live here in the Bay Area, what can we do to help with this cause? Yeah, um, I, I had given some thought to that specifically in this first opportunity to be with you at Google, because I think there's some specific things that you could help us do. In general, we need uh, people to give. I think all, all NGOs need, need donors. Uh, our work as an independent human rights organization depends on people making gifts, uh, unrestricted gifts that allow us to work on issues that the other people don't want and to begin to uh, develop programmatic responses before big donors are willing to. So individuals like you all who make gifts uh, allow us to do the things that we, we do. Um, also we need people who help us to advocate, who, who are willing to talk to their friends uh, about Central America, about immigration, uh, and even about Crystal South's work and to help us expand our network of support in the Bay Area. Um, but more specifically with Google, uh, this is something that I think we need to, we can continue in conversation about. Uh, but NGOs, we don't have tech budgets. We, we, we don't have uh, technical expertise to look at information security, uh, communications plans and strategies and tools. Any number of things like that uh, often become like the last thing that you do if the grant, uh, the last cent, a couple cents in the grant, right? Uh, 
Uh, and one of the things that I'm absolutely convinced of is we, we have a series of human rights tools. Uh, I mentioned that we have litigation and legal assistance, we have protection units, we have research units. Uh, these are all tools for advocacy and assistance. But one of the most important tools right now, especially in the advent of this resurgence of authoritarianism, uh, is our ability to influence public opinion. Uh, the litigation or the Supreme Court ruling wouldn't have happened if we wouldn't have first won the, the national narrative about displacement. The government said it doesn't exist and that the victims are liars, but the media believed our statistics and our information. Uh, and I think if you did a survey of opinion in, in El Salvador, uh, overwhelmingly people would support our position and the Supreme Court ruling. But we don't have the tools uh, to do that uh, so systematically. I think we have, to, as an organization, we need to have more sophisticated ways of assessing current public opinion, identifying sectors of support, uh, identifying the means of communication to, uh, and messages to effectively uh, influence public opinion. And that public opinion and expectation guarantees that a Supreme Court ruling is implemented or that a new law holds weight. That becomes one of those primary bulwarks against the assumption of impunity. The, the, the powerful groups in the countries can do whatever they want because if they believe that the citizenry will confront them, they'll think twice. Uh, NGOs, human rights NGOs, just like we're in the 1980s uh, in terms of communication strategies and resources. Uh, and, and I mentioned information security. You know, we do the best we can, but I'm sure you all know a lot more. So the third one is something to explore, how we can work t more closely with you all uh, who have skill sets that we don't as kind of human rights dorks, right? <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, I have a question um, about indirect support uh, to neighboring countries. I hear that in Europe, a lot of politicians across the spectrum um, are trying to shift the narrative w to regarding migration to advocate for supporting countries in the region, especially to reduce economic migration and therefore shore up the right of asylum. So we hear politicians in Scandinavia who are pushing for more support for Turkey or to have richer countries like Saudi Arabia um, taking refugees. I'm wondering if you think that um, the US can do anything given that immigration to the US is really sensitive to provide better resources to Mexico, Costa Rica, other countries in that region? Or if you think that's an argument to deflect responsibility to states that couldn't necessarily handle an influx of refugees? Mm -hmm. The issue that you're, you're touching on is called uh, burden sharing. It's established in the 1951 Refugee Convention that no state, no one state has, should bear the burden of all refugees in the world. Uh, but the, the whole world should bear that burden. <laughs> Uh, and I think uh, you know, there's a, uh, in the world, the overwhelming majorities of refugees are hosted by poor and middle income countries. Uh, and what I said at the, at the outset of my, my presentation here, the United States is not suffering uh, an immigration crisis or a refugee crisis numerically. And Europe really isn't either. The largest numbers are in poor and under uh, uh, and middle income countries. And so, um, how do we respond collectively to build capacity but also share burden? Uh, and the way that the international community is doing that is through uh, what they call the Global Compact on Refugees, uh, but through new uh, strategies to, uh, to um, externalize responsibility. So for example, the United States supports Mexico with the Southern Border Plan. It's this, this idea of extending the border to the south to stop migrants before they come, uh, the, it, which can be seen as a way of cutting off traditional access, which is at the border to refugee protection. Right? There's, there's a whole series of uh, uh, actions, like you mentioned, that are trying to find ways to skirt a, a shared responsibility directly. Um, and that, that, that tendency uh, also confronts uh, what is the distinction between a migrant and a refugee? Because what refugees are doing around the world, uh, they're behaving differently than they used to. Uh, we have a refugee crisis because the international community is incapable of ending conflict. So old conflicts uh, keep going on and new conflicts become protracted. And so you have an accumulation of displaced people 
uh, and the world is unable to supply the humanitarian needs of those uh, growing populations. Uh, and so what refugees are doing is they're not, like in El Salvador in the 1980s, many refugees crossed the border into Honduras and waited in refugee camps for the conflict to end. And when it ended, they returned. Today what refugees are doing is I'm not going to sit around in a refugee camp and wait for them to give me food and, because I don't think this thing's ever going to end. And even if it did, I don't think I'll be safe in my country. And so they enter into migratory, route, migratory routes. So we call that mixed flows. And so the whole world is trying to figure out who's a refugee, who's a migrant, what are the responsibilities if one's a refugee and one's a migrant. Uh, and it's all very complicated. Uh, the largest emerging displacement crisis in the world is Venezuela. Uh, possibly by the next year, there'll be more people displaced in Venezuela or something similar to what you have in Syria. But there's no armed conflict in Venezuela. And so all of the countries in South America are saying, we have a bunch of Venezuelan migrants. We don't have refugees here. Uh, but there's also, so there's, a, there's a sort of a crisis and we don't know how to interpret what's happening. We're skirting responsibilities collectively. Uh, and instead of trying to assume responsibilities, and generate a, 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 a comprehensive humanitarian response to displacement and conflict, uh, we're trying to skirt responsibilities and externalize it to countries of origin or host countries of refugees. Having said that, uh, I also think, for example, the bilateral support of the United States government to the three countries in the Northern Triangle to build protection uh, responses is important. I hope I'll be in Washington, D.C. in October, and I'm going to take the Supreme Court ruling, and I'm going to say to Congress, this is a roadmap for response. Support it. Uh, so I think that we have to play both, uh, both roles, assuming the responsibilities at home, treating people with, with dignity and respect, independent of their condition, uh, but also be, uh, have solidarity with countries of origin as they try and transform those root causes. That was a long answer to your question, but I could actually just go on and on about it because it's very, <laughs> it's the major contentious issue uh, in international relations right now. Um, that, that, it's just a, a big, big topic. <laughs> I have a couple. <clears throat> just to be, um, to get back to your specific example, so what was the outcome for the family? Yeah, um, they left the country. That all of them have left the country and uh, are in the process of refugee resettlement somewhere else in the world. The last member to leave the country was the father, the patriarch. Um, and he stayed in the country long enough uh, to give testimony at the Supreme Court. Uh, and, and it was a powerful experience because it's not normal for the Supreme Court to ask for those sort of first-hand testimonies. Uh, and when we did a lot of witness prep with him prior to, the, uh, to his, his interrogation at the court, uh, and the guy, he was like, he, he did numbers. He, he did the numbers about how much is in the security budget of, the, of El Salvador. He said, we as citizens are paying all this money into security, and look, my whole family's dead. I lost my house, I lost my livelihood, I lost my wife. So they owe me all that money back. <laughs> and, uh, and we talked to him about that, not necessarily being the approach that we should take in the, in the Supreme Court. But he did an amazing job. Uh, you can imagine that there were 15 defense lawyers representing you know, the highest officials in the Salvadoran government. Uh, and in his testimony, he said, you know, uh, I was displaced by gangs at first. And when we sought help from the, Salvador, from the government, uh, there was none. And I lost my home, I lost 25 years of mortgage, I lost my business. Uh, my family was dispersed, we lost all of our belongings. Uh, and then once we were in hiding and, and, and hoping to find protection, uh, and he turned and looked directly at the defense attorney for the Minister of Justice and Security and he said, you killed my wife. Uh, and, and so it was a pretty powerful moment, the, the magistrates of the court you know, in open court recognizing extrajudicial killings and, and procedural fraud and investigations and, and serious uh, issues. Uh, but he had the courage to do it. And when he was done, uh, we, talk, we interviewed him and asked him how he felt. Uh, and he just started crying tears of uh, happiness. Uh, something similar happens with the war crimes trials when the, when the survivors have given testimony in court for so long. 
uh, society has told them that what happened to them is either their fault, their criminals, or it just didn't happen. Uh, and when they're able to tell their story in front of the judicial authorities, uh, it's an important reparation to, to have society acknowledge the terrible things that have happened to you uh, and acknowledge that those aren't your fault. Right? So that's what happened to the family. Through your process of one case, one family, one individual at a time, how many cases, families have you, Christosol, worked with and helped yeah. in the period you've been working? Well, I can remember case number one. <laughs> uh, uh, our first case, we, were, we, were, we detected this problem of displacement because we were uh, administering the High Commissioner for Refugees program in El Salvador. So our, our mandate was to assist people from other countries seeking asylum in El Salvador which is very few people. Um, and, and Salvadorans began to come to our office uh, and, and trying to request asylum, <laughs> which you can't do until you leave the country, right? Uh, but we, we got so many cases that we decided that we should probably close this one program down and begin to think about how we might assist Salvadorans fleeing violence in the country. And, and we began to talk around and, and, and trying to do advocacy internally in the country and also externally about the issue. But there was really no context for anyone to understand it until the child migrant crisis in 2014. Um, but I, what I wanted to say about that is that our first case was a family of like 25 people who uh, were forced to flee their homes uh, and ended up camping outside the U.S. Embassy. <laughs> and when we, when, when we heard about that, uh, I said, oh man, this is, we have to put our money where our, our mouth is. And we had been planning on building like, you know, our protection responses and safe houses and things like that, but we had no resources yet. We weren't ready for it. Uh, and I said to my program director, the embassy is going to call us before 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm sure of it. Uh, so <laughs> basically the first case, we, I spent like the payroll for the next month to try and activate our first safe house, literally from our accountants all the way to our, like our tiny legal staff. We were like an organization of eight people at that point. We all took turns operating the safe house and uh, that was case one. Uh, and now we're on case like 450 something. So we've assisted you know, thousands of indi individual people uh, and now we're operating in Guatemala and Honduras and beginning to see some of the first results of our work there as well. This was case 91. One other question. On the human rights-based approach that Chris Saul has adopted, can you explain that a little bit in three or four minutes? Yeah. <laughs> and where the genesis of it and how you're applying it? Yeah, the, I've used words that are, uh, that evoke a rights-based approach, accountability, responsibility, the state. <laughs> in human rights, uh, when, when after World War II, hum the sort of international human rights regime was set up, it was set up on the basis of a nation-state system. And the idea is that a nation-state is the primary guarantor of human rights, but also the primary violator of human rights. And that means that uh, it's, it's crime until the state fails to respond in a systematic way and then it becomes human rights violation. Right? A murder is a murder, but the state's responsible for investigating and prosecuting and protecting. States have to prevent, uh, repair, protect citizens, right? That's what they do. Um, and so a rights-based approach is this idea uh, that there are people who have rights, but then there are also organizations and people who have corresponding duties. And so when we look at a problem from a rights-based approach, we can't, as an organization, substitute the people who have rights, in the case of the victims, them, and their processes of seeking justice. And we can't substitute the state in their responsibilities to fulfill rights. Uh, so our actions have to be empowering of both those parties, meaning we have to empower the victims to activate justice, to, to hold uh, duty bearers or the state accountable, but also we have to find ways of strengthening the capacity of the state to fulfill through positive actions. Like for example, uh, in El Salvador, we're, we just opened a joint safe house with the Willem Women's Development Institute, and where we're transferring our knowledge and models of protecting families to a state actor. But also, 
we have to hold them accountable for systematic or uh, situations of discrimination through actions like litigation. So what we can't do is enter into uh, the country uh, and begin to substitute the state by only uh, assisting. That's the responsibility of the state. What we're trying to do is demonstrate how that could be done and then activating the state uh, to do it. So what's actually worked out really strange with this whole case of the litigation is through legal action we created an obligation, a clear one on the state. Through the presentation of uh, new legislation we've designed a national response and organized how the state is supposed to be responsible to victims. Uh, and in developing legal mod models of assistance, humanitarian assistance, psychosocial assistance, we also can show the state how they will respond. That's a rights-based approach. All of the, it, we've been able to assist now thousands of people, but in doing that, we've also demonstrate, demonstrated how nationally uh, the, the government could respond and created an obligation to do it. It's a different way of working than only uh, than limiting your actions to humanitarian assistance. So how do you ensure that as you're going through the process, you are working not only with victims and with the state, but also with diverse voices who come from within the state and externally to create a pathway for the state to operate right. with victims? Yeah, um, you can't only confront. You can't just be confrontational, right? Otherwise, you're just kind of on the outside screaming uh, uh, towards the, those who hold power, right? You have to find entry points and begin to work also cooperatively. Um, so we've done that in all three countries. In El Salvador, uh, the Human Rights Ombudsman, which is a national office for human rights, uh, recognized forced displacement, I think about four years ago, in a partnership agreement with Crystal South. And we began to... Uh, we did you know, assessments with how they assist victims and, and, and drafted new protocols uh, and helped them to begin to respond. So they were the first state institution to respond. And we've done that with the Public Defender's Office, with the Women's Development Institute. Um, we're working on that with the Ministry of, of Health. So you have to find allies. The state is a big thing. It's not monolithic. Uh, and so you have to work both that side, that more confrontational litigation side, to keep a, um, an obligation going, but also to work cooperatively to show uh, how response uh, and, and strengthen capacities for fulfillment. So that, that you're right that there has to be that balance. Um, and, and that means you have to navigate tricky, uh, tricky political alliances sometimes. John, maybe one last thing before you leave. If you, I should call your attention to just one photo here that, uh, this one at the bottom, that's a photo uh, from the courtroom uh, in Morazan, where we're prosecuting the El Mazote war crime trial. And this day, uh, this woman, Rosario, was giving her testimony. She's a survivor of the massacre. Uh, and this guy right here with the gray hair and the glasses is, uh, was responsible for the Salvadoran Armed Forces in 1980. Uh, and he had to present himself in court that day. And you can see this look that she's giving him. I think that's another example of the light, right? It's, it's, a, it's a really powerful photo um, because she has had to wait 30 years to be able to confront. Thank you all.